Great. All right. So we'll set our motivation. So just refuge in Bodhicitta, taking a moment. Sange chudum sugi chunam lai janchu padu dani kapsu chia dagi chunyan gi pe sonam gi rola penche sange drupa show Sange chudum sugi chunam la janchu padu dani kapsu chi dagi chunyan gi pe sonam gi rola penche sange drupa Sange churam sogi churam ha, janchu padu dani kapsu chi, dagi chun yen gi pe sonam ki, krola penche sange drupa show. Okay. So today we're going to do a um, really uh, interesting topic, the five omnipresent mental factors. I find this presentation so interesting because it's so viscerally a part of our everyday lived experience and can really help us understand where we have control and power and where we don't, where habit is strong and where habit can be influenced. It's really an interesting framework to examine. But before we get into it, I, I thought we would do just a very brief review of last week. And then I'll check in if you guys had questions about last week before we get into anything else. All right, so brief review of last week, and then we'll jump into omnipresent mental factors. Okay. So last week we were looking at how we categorize things in Buddhism, particularly from the um, minds and mental factors literature, particularly from the lower tenant schools perspective because they give a very clear presentation. So at the top we have all phenomena. So everything existent. Everything is empty of inherent existence, all phenomena. And then we break all phenomena into two main categories. We've got permanent phenomena, which are non-momentary, doesn't change moment to moment, and they're not necessarily eternal, right? So permanent phenomena are like static. They're not changing but they might not be there around forever, but while they do exist, they don't exist in a changeable way. So permanent phenomena are things that are not particularly problematic in our everyday life, which is why we don't talk about them very often. Almost everything we're working with on the spiritual path is related to impermanent phenomena. So that's what we're going to be looking into. So impermanent phenomena is momentary, changes moment to moment, but may have like an eternal continuity like our mental consciousness. So it might be something that changes moment to moment to moment, but that thread of continuity is something that exists forever. Okay, so impermanent phenomena get broken down into three. They get broken down into form, which is like um, matter, like a body or a rock, okay? Consciousness, which is the subject of the course, and um, consciousness is that which is clear and knowing. That's the big category. And then we have non-associated composites, which are neither form nor consciousness like a person, because a person has a body, which is form, and a mind, which is consciousness. So it's neither of those. So looking primarily at consciousness, because that's really where we're working. We have consciousness subdivided into main minds and mental factors, but really think of them as aspects of consciousness. Don't think about them too separate. We're just mentally separating them for the purposes of looking at how we can train them and bring more happiness, more positivity, more beneficial activities, more kindness, more benefit. We're looking at which ones and how they work with each other in that framework, but don't make it too concretely separate. It's all consciousness. Main minds are consciousness, mental factors are consciousness. And so just take a minute, make sure that you're on mute. Okay, 
So we also touched on the tantric presentation. And in the tantric presentation, in some ways, it's a little bit easier because it's just framed in terms of a coarse consciousness, a subtle consciousness, and an extremely subtle consciousness. And that framework is um, a lot more straightforward in terms of understanding, but is not necessarily as easy in terms of training yourself. So both presentations come together in Tibetan Buddhism for the most part. Okay, so just keep coming back to the basic, which is that the nature of all consciousness, no matter how we categorize it, is clear and knowing, meaning reflective and able to hold objects in, it, in awareness. Okay, so this is the main thing to keep in mind. Everything else is just details. So before we get into anything else, were there parts of that presentation that you were curious about? or wanted to clarify or had issues with or anything like that. Got phenomena, permanent, impermanent, form, consciousness, not associated compositional factors, then consciousness divisions and divisions and divisions, right? But is it sort of coming into some clarity? I have oh, yeah, question. Andrea, go ahead. Okay, so as far as phenomena are concerned, we have the permanent and the impermanent. When you were talking about the permanent, when you referenced him, I was like, oh, yeah, like a rock. And then I saw that that was an example of a form. Yes. Could you give us a good example of a, a permanent phenomena, just so I have a frame of reference? Um, the most common example is space. Ah, Unkinded yes. space. I remember you um, mentioning that. Yeah. Another example is emptiness itself, which is more tricky because what the phenomena is, um, if we're talking about like the self being empty of inherent existence, the self relatively changes moment to moment to moment, but the emptiness of the self is permanent. So yeah. that becomes a bit of a trickier philosophical point, which is why it's easier to say like space. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah like that. Um, some aspects of the Buddha's mind may not be changing, but the Buddha's mind is experiencing changeable phenomena and so like that. So um, those more kind of nitty gritty philosophical points that have some more argument with them. Um, those ones are more just kind of fundamental exercises to explore. In terms of our tangible lived experience, it's impermanent things that cause all the trouble but also impermanent things that can help us develop, which is why we pretty much always talk about impermanent things. Yeah, yeah. does that help? So a rock is not permanent because it does change moment to moment. It's just subtle change. You know, like if that rock was to sit there for a hundred years, it would be a little bit smaller, <laughs> very subtly in ways only scientists could see, but it's not like it suddenly changes into a smaller rock. It's gradually fading to dust moment to moment. We just don't see that subtle impermanence. So permanent really means permanent, not just changing so slowly that it outlasts our lived experience in this life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. permanent really means does not change at all whatsoever during yeah. the, the duration of its existence. Okay. Yeah. Thank you again. Yeah, yeah, good question. Yeah, other other thoughts before we dig into anything new? You got your permanent, you got your impermanent. Then you got your impermanent categorization. Form is discussed a little in Buddhism. It's talked about a little bit in when we go into cosmology and the Ambidharma Kosha, um, how form exists, what you do with form. It's an interesting conversation, but for the most part, we, we think nowadays that scientists describe form and how form relates to other forms very well and very clearly. Um, it can marry up with some of the Buddhist presentations, but science has a good handle on how form works. And we can kind of rely on the scientists to help us understand and explain kind of the how of form and Buddhism to explain kind of the why of form. If that makes sense? Um, the form that's most problematic for us is our physical form because we identify with it as us. 
So if we think it's a beautiful form, that's problematic. If we think it's an ugly form, that's problematic. If we think of it as ourselves, that's natural and normal, but unnecessary and not true. We have all sorts of relationships with this form, but all of them are pretty much problematic. So if we're talking about form, the main form we discuss is our physical body. And we wanna shift from identification with it to seeing how it's a very useful vehicle and how a human body is a particularly useful vehicle for spiritual development, but it still is kind of like a set of clothes that eventually we'll discard and get a new set. It's not us. Right. So when we talk about form, usually it's a discussion about the human body. Then when we talk about non-associated composites, that's a conversation about a person for the most part, because a person has form and has consciousness. A person is labeled in dependence upon form and consciousness, but it's neither of those because it's labeled in dependence upon both. So it's a shorter conversation. So then we dive right into consciousness. And that's kind of where the fun begins and where the problem starts and where the possibilities are. But I think it's still helpful to know that broader categorization because it's not like we're talking in terms of everything is only mind. It's not so simple as that. Yeah, so far, so good. Yeah, okay, <laughs> so far, so good. All right. Okay, so more subdivisions, but don't worry, we're not gonna do them all today. When you're looking at consciousness, you've got your main minds, which are also translated as primary consciousnesses. There are six types, and they are very easy to remember because eye, ear, nose, tongue, touch, and mental. Yeah, that makes it quite easy. You know these guys, but don't think of them as the organs that they utilize. Think of them as consciousness that happens to use those organs, but we're not talking about the organs of the eye, the ear, etc. We're talking about the mental faculty. Then when we talk about mental factors, there are kind of mainly 51. It's not an exhaustive list, but 51 are kind of the most important ones, and they're put into six handy categories. The first category is the five omnipresent mental factors, and these guys are really interesting. And as the name would indicate, omnipresent, meaning always there. So in terms of our mental experience, these five are happening all the time. Okay. So if we're to take a few of the categories, the five omnipresent mental factors, the five object ascertaining mental factors, and the four variable mental factors, these categories, these three can be treated together since they all share the characteristic of being functions of the mind that in and of themselves are neither wholesome or unwholesome. Okay, so these categories of mind need other mental factors to color them, to make them good or bad or wholesome or unwholesome, positive or negative. In and of themselves, they're neutral. And so we're grouping them because they're all neutral, divorced from other mental factors. It's just that we usually have other mental factors playing out as well. So you can see very tiny, there are 11 virtuous mental factors, six root delusions and 20 secondary afflictions. Okay, so we're gonna start with the five omnipresent mental factors, but in without, how to say, as soon as we start talking about lists, there's usually a few people that feel a panic to try to memorize the list. And um, just to kind of break the illusion that you could ever memorize the whole list, remember that there are 84,000 different delusions. <laughs> Okay, 84,000, all right. So don't put any pressure on yourself. Just think, all right, main minds, mental factors. Sky-like, cloud-like, that is enough, okay? We're talking about cloud-like ones and of the cloud-like ones, you already understand about positive states of mind and negative states of mind. That will be a really familiar conversation when we get to that. We're talking about things like, Non-attachment is positive, attachment is negative. You know, it's a classic tale. Yeah. 
So when we're talking about the five omnipresent mental factors, the reason they're particularly interesting is there's a huge relationship between them and the karma you create and experience. And that is your everyday experience of happiness and suffering, as well as how you label things and how you engage with things and why. So that particular division is very useful. But again, like take any kind of scholastic performative pressure off of yourself to memorize it all, get a sense of it with, no, with a really relaxed mind, try and just kind of get a, an experiential taste of them. And then gradually as time goes by, the ones that are most significant to your practice will just stick naturally because they're interesting to you. Okay, so um, no one get uptight and nerdy about it, okay? Just enjoy the ride. Okay, five omnipresent mental factors. These guys are the five elements essential to any state of consciousness, however gross or subtle they may be. They constitute the inherent makeup of cognition. Without it, could not function. So these five omnipresent mental factors is what makes consciousness function and engage. Okay, and here's what they are. So they are feeling, discernment, intention, contact, and attention. And from the Compendium of Knowledge, it says that all that the five omnipresent mental factors accompany all six primary consciousnesses. So your I primary consciousness has feeling, discernment, intention, contact, attention. Your nose primary consciousness has feeling, discernment, intention, contact, attention. All of them have all five. And when you look at these five, you might think, I don't know that my mind is that busy. I don't know that all of that really is going on all the time. Or you might think my mind is way busier than that, way more of that is happening than is what is described here. So let's unpack that a little bit. Okay, <laughs> so when you're sitting and watching your mind and watching your thoughts, for some people, it is continuously verbal, right? There is a, a literal train of thought that is in words, talking to yourself. There's an internal narrative. You're saying, this is happening, now this is happening. I like this, I don't like that. Here's what I think, here's what it reminds me of. And it is chatty in there. Some people, not so much. Some people spacious in a open, happy way. Some people spacey in a vague, dissociative way. Some people kind of dull and spaced out. Yeah, but it's not so chatty. And I'm not saying any of that is positive or negative in and of itself. It's just to kind of identify the fact that we are all very different in how actively verbal our minds are. And when you hear these descriptions, don't think that it's always words. It's not always words. Animals have the five omnipresent mental factors, even if they're not verbal in any way, okay? And these five omnipresent mental factors, they're existing simultaneously and they have a relationship to one another. So there's kind of a sequential relationship as well as a simultaneous arising. So there's no moment that you don't have all five, but the way to understand it is to understand that all five are changing moment to moment. They each have their own continuum in a way and how they're experiencing life and what they're telling you about life is related to each other. And that becomes kind of a really interesting thing to figure out, why am I happy today? Why am I sad today? Why do I like this? Why do I dislike that? It's kind of going in that direction. So when you see all of these, it's like you have a minimum of five mental factors present at any moment, but you may have many, many more. Yeah but minimum five. Okay, so we'll dig into each of the five. Okay, so feeling is the easiest to understand, but it's also the easiest to misunderstand because we use the word feeling in the West almost equivalent to emotion. And in Buddhism, feeling is not emotion. 
Feeling is an experience of pleasure, pain, or neutrality. Feeling experiences the results of our past actions and can lead to reactions of attachment, anger, confusion, and so forth. Okay, so when we say that feeling is an experience of pleasure, pain, or neutrality, what we're saying is either physically or mentally or both, all the time there is a sensation, there is an experience, right? So you could think, okay, what's the feeling in my body? Not about if you like it or not, not about what you're concluding about it, but just the raw experience. And you might think, yeah, from the neck to the shoulders, not too bad. From the shoulders through the torso, oh, bit of a stiff back. Oh, hips are okay, knees are a little grumpy, right? But you're sort of like aware that you're having a generally neutral physical experience or a slightly unpleasant physical experience or kind of a pleasant mental experience or physical experience, right? Something is going on physically, whether you're consciously noticing it or not. Do you agree that every moment of every day, your body is experiencing something pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, right? That may or may not correlate with what your mind is doing. Your mind might be quite happy and chipper and have a pleasant kind of experience, but you have a stiff neck, right? This can happen. Or your body could be totally comfortable. You could be soaking in the tub. You've got your Epsom salts, but you are grumpy. <laughs> Right? And you're having an unpleasant mental experience, even though your body is fine. So sometimes they correlate and sometimes they don't, but you're always having a physical experience and you're always having a mental experience. And even people that have paralysis in the body, there's still some sort of physical experience that's happening related to the mind. Yeah, the mind is talking to the body, even if the body isn't having a very reactive experience, there's something going on usually. And when we're talking about feeling, I think it's really interesting to understand that feeling is where karma is ripening in present time, in real time, but it's past karma. So old karma is being experienced as your present day feeling. How you respond to that is creating your future. And you've heard this framework, I think many, many times, but I think we don't often sit in the middle of our experience and say, this present moment came from the past. Usually we think this present moment is about this present moment. So if my body is uncomfortable, it's the cushion's fault. <laughs> or if my mind is uncomfortable, it's the fault of whatever things I'm listening to and thinking about. There's not that, um, it's not that immediate. There's lag time. So what you're feeling is related to the past. And I think that can help, especially if you have difficult relationships with people, because you're used to being around you is suffering. <laughs> being around you is suffering. Therefore, you must be giving me the suffering. And that's an exaggeration. But it really feels that way because it's like, well, I am suffering and you're right in front of me. I'm, you know, I'm no genius, but it seems like cause and effect is really obvious. I'm suffering. You're in front of me. Must be your fault. Yeah. And it's not so straightforward, is it? And so when we're looking at these mental factors, it really is checking in with how each of them get conditioned each of them get habituated a certain way. And then we just take it for granted to be truth and accurate. And it's, it's disempowering. And it's why it's so hard to change habits because it feels kind of inevitable. Yeah, so feeling is not emotion. Feeling may be related to this broad category emotion that we talk about in the West, but emotion is not even on the list of minds and mental factors because it's too broad. It's too broad. There are many, many things coming together, which we would then categorize as an emotion. In Buddhism, we pull them apart and separate them and they each have their own story. Okay. Um, then we have discernment or recognition, discrimination, depending on your translator. And this functions to distinguish, it is this and not that. 
and to apprehend the characteristics of an object. It differentiates and identifies. And this is one of the classic ones where it feels like it must be verbal, right? Like this is a house, this is a hand, this is a handbag. It's not necessarily in words. It can be in terms of you're knowing that something is solid or you're knowing that something is liquid or you're knowing that something is hurting you or you're knowing that something is helping you. It can be the way you're framing and describing your experience. It can be many, many things, but it doesn't have to be literally the labels. It's more this distinguishing ability that understands characteristics of things. So then we have intention. And of course, intention is one of the most important ones. Intention moves the primary consciousness and its accompanying mental factors to the object. It is the conscious and automatic motivating element that causes the mind to involve itself and apprehend its object. So keyword, involve itself. It is action, karma. What is karma? Mental factor of intention. So although the mental factor of intention itself is not constructive, destructive, or neutral, it becomes so depending on other mental factors, so attachment, anger, and other accompanying that mental state. So when you think intention, think the movement of the mind. Yeah, the movement of the mind that goes towards or away from things, whether internal phenomena or external phenomena, it's the part of the mind that moves, but it's not just moving, it's kind of engaging and um, kind of getting all up in the business of what it's engaging with. And together with that movement is either, I want more, I want less. It is good, it is bad. And there's very often an afflicted characteristic together with that intention. So we're having intention every second of every day and on a quiet day with no drama, the karma that we're creating is probably neutral or mildly negative or mildly positive but we're creating tons every single day, every moment of mind, right? So what we wanna ask ourselves is, it's not about stopping intention. We can't stop intention. It's about asking what is, what is riding on top of our intention. Yeah, what's it sort of traveling together with? What's it holding hands with? And that's why we do things like at the beginning of class, setting our motivation. Some people even say, set your intention. Yeah, but really what we're saying is tell your intention to be good. <laughs> tell your intention to carry with it what's productive and useful and going in the direction that you want your mind to go. So it's kind of like launching your mind and relaunching your mind whenever you set your motivation or revive your motivation. You're conditioning that mental factor of intention to carry with it good friends. <laughs> Yes, to say, love, tag along with intention, will ya? Yeah, because otherwise anger is going to co-opt it and there'll be trouble. Yeah, you with me so far? These are pretty kind of familiar to your lived experience. Okay, so look at these two together. You've got feeling, which is experiences the results of our past actions. And then you've got intention, action itself. So there is a strong correlation between these two. And what we wanna make sure is that we understand the correlation, but don't repeat the negative correlation. So what you wanna do is notice that if you're feeling unpleasant, if you're feeling pain, it can lead to anger, which plants karmic seeds for future suffering, but it doesn't mean it has to. You want to kind of break the association of what your feelings are telling you. Okay, and so this is where we get arguments with um, maybe pop psychology, because they'll say trust your feelings. Yes, um, you know, or your gut biome or something. I don't know. <laughs> trust your feelings. And your feelings have information that is useful, but it does not mean that they are wisdom. 
And that's what we have to understand. It's useful information. Whatever is whatever we're feeling, that's useful information. If we decide it's useful information, but it's not truth, nor should it be our criteria for truth. So we might think this is vivid. This is a strong experience. Therefore, there's something in it that is very important. And that might be true, but the importance you're giving it might be the wrong importance. Yeah. It might be that the importance is, oh, wow, I've created a strong association with negativity related to this person, this relationship, or what it reminds me of. And now that's watered the seeds of my old karma and I am suffering again. So that's useful information. But if you're thinking, I feel uncomfortable around you, therefore you are bad, that is not the whole story. So I think this makes sense to us, right? But on one sense, then part of you says, what about instinct? What about self-preservation? What about kind of um, recognition of habits and the fact that we need to understand kind of how people are in order to protect ourselves from people that might take advantage of us or wanna hurt us? Shouldn't we follow our feelings? Because those feelings have been conditioned through a lifetime of experience, knowing what a dodgy person is like. Yeah, so, so this is kind of a normal conflict to come up as you think, okay, feelings aren't wisdom. And yet if I don't listen to my feelings, I'm gonna keep making the same mistakes and put myself in danger. So what you wanna understand is what is the difference between a feeling that you immediately believe in and has shown itself to be true time and time again, based on the way you've discerned the elements around it. And what is just kind of, um, a visceral reactivity that you haven't given any space or time to examining. Yeah. So you can kind of take a step back and think about maybe the Lojong tradition. And in the seven point mind training, there's a slogan that says, always meditate on whatever provokes resentment, right? And so if you're feeling resentment, if you're feeling, and I'm saying feeling loosely because resentment is un unpleasant, right? And then resentment comes on top of it with a secondary mental factor. So you have unpleasant plus resentment. But say you're feeling resentment, you wanna ask yourself, what are all the pieces of that? How is it functional? How is it dysfunctional? How am I grasping at inherent existence of the person that has triggered all of this? How am I grasping at inherent existence of myself, the experiencer? Yada, yada, yada. Because this is a big feeling, it's worth investigating. Yeah. So it's just kind of taking a little bit of the power back because the way we normally live is if it's a pleasant feeling, everything in the area we could give credit to. Yeah. You have a pleasant feeling, then your mind is saying, oh, why do I have this pleasant feeling? I love a pleasant feeling. I would like more of this pleasant feeling. So it must be the food I just ate or it must be the person I just talked to, or it must be the cozy blanket I put around me. Therefore, more please. That's what we do, right? We just kind of arbitrarily pick something in the scene and say, that must be why I like this. This must be why I'm comfortable. And then we chase it and we want more of it. And if it's a person, we get mad at them if it's not working the same way it did a moment ago but it was only one of countless conditions and the conditions were never the cause. So when you have a feeling of this is pleasant, you're trying to catch yourself before it turns into attachment. And when you have a feeling of unpleasant, you're trying to catch yourself before it turns into anger. And when you have a neutral feeling, you're trying to catch yourself before it turns into indifference. And this is such a powerful way to live because usually we correlate the two the feeling and what we decide it means and what we decide to do. We, we interweave them as if they're not separable, but of course they are. We've even done it before we met Buddhism. We just maybe didn't articulate it to ourselves. Was it making sense? Yeah. So the relationship between feeling and intention is a really important one. And then we look at ah tension, and I'm exaggerating the word ah just so that it doesn't get mixed up with intention. It's also translated as mental engagement. 
So this functions to direct the primary consciousness and its concomitant mental factors, meaning its associated mental factors, to the object and to actually apprehend the object. So it focuses and holds the mind on an object without allowing it to move elsewhere. So it's kind of like focus, right? There are other mental factors that are also a bit like focus, but kind of colloquially, you can think attention is like what's in your mind's eye or what's in the framework of your experience. What are you attending to? And then contact. Contact connects the object, the cognitive faculty, and primary consciousness, and thereby acting as a basis for feeling of pleasure, pain, and indifference. It's the cause of feeling, okay? Meaning it's like the immediate condition that kind of waters the seeds of the past karma, not in the sense necessarily of the substantial cause. So it's a cause of feeling in that whatever you're coming into contact with is the seed watering factor, okay? So just to put it really ordinary, it's a bit like if you do not have a drinking problem, you can walk into a bar and it's not going to be that you're coming into contact with things that are going to have an association for bad old habit. But if you are an alcoholic and you have a history of problem with alcohol, that exact same bar coming into contact with it is going to ripen all things and associations and make it a lot more easy for you to make bad choices. So you know it's not the bar's fault, right? It's about your associations with the elements involved. However, if you have a problem with alcohol, you know it's best for you to avoid the bar, even though it's not the bar's fault if you in overindulge. So this is how we approach the mental factor of contact, is we really understand that coming into contact with certain people, certain activities, certain books, certain television shows, certain things, even though from their own side are not bad or good, because of our associations with them, it's very hard for us to maintain a positive, beneficial state of mind. So you consciously don't make contact with those things while you build your strength. And you're still not blaming the thing that you're avoiding even though you know the thing you're avoiding has a huge part in the bad behavior you might do. Makes sense, yes? So it's a little bit like if you have some dodgy friends who always gossip and you're trying to not gossip so much, you might need to avoid them a little bit while you build your strength. <laughs> and then once you build your strength, you might be able to hang out with them again and not gossip and even kind of pull them towards more positive, useful conversations about ideas, about possibilities, about you know all sorts of things. But until you build your strength, the power of their habit and the power of your habit, it's not a good collision. So you're avoiding them for your sake as well as theirs while not blaming either of you, for example. So this mental factor of contact is really important to understand because it's, it's the coming together factor. And it's why we have things like vows in Buddhism. It's not about the things that we're refraining from per se all the time. It's that our associations with them have become problematic. Yeah, so again, while we build our strength, we avoid certain activities. Of course, there are some activities that are going to be negative no matter what, like killing. But there's a number of them that it's very much about context. Okay, so we're going to look now at their kind of relationship with each other. There's a bit more about contact, but I think we'll skip it for today and maybe come back to it. So feeling experiences, discernment recognizes. Attention holds, intention moves, contact connects. So it's like one, two, three, four, five. It feels like it's linear. And remember that they're all arising simultaneously, continuously, but each of them is changing moment to moment related to what the other ones are doing. So what you do as a practitioner is you just pick one, just pick any of them. It doesn't even matter which one, but pick one to start working with and ask yourself, 
can I change something about my relationship to this mental factor and make it more usable and uh, productive? So you could start with feeling and feeling has an influence on how we go on to label that experience. So you're looking at the relationship first between feeling and discernment. And you realize that whatever you're feeling colors what you recognize your situation and the elements involved to be. And you decide, I'm going to start breaking associations and examining associations so that what I feel has a bit of space before I go on to label. Does it make sense? You're just picking one little set, one little connection, and seeing if you can kind of change the relationship in a more beneficial way. But you could just as easily kind of go on and look at discernment first. And discernment, you can look at how hearing, reflecting, and meditating help recondition how we discern and go on to focus on various things. So discernment is kind of like the one that we pick as our project when we do analytical meditation. Analytical meditation is kind of reconditioning discernment because it's gonna label whether we educate it or not. So right now we have like uneducated discernment that's just kind of operating from our life's experience, some of which is wisdom based, some of which is afflicted, you know, it's just a whole jumble of experiences. And we describe our situation to ourselves from a very mixed set of information, some information colored well, some colored poorly, right? So when you do analytical meditation, what you're doing is first, you have to understand the concept like love, okay, take something really easy. You know that love in Buddhism is the wish for others to have happiness. And then, you know, attachment in Buddhism is referring to an exaggeration of the good qualities or impact of a person, a situation, or an object. And so you're just kind of thinking about the logic of love is more beneficial, attachment's more problematic. In my life, I have conflated the two. <laughs> In my life, I have mushed them together and conflict ensued, drama ensued, suffering ensued. That was unfortunate. Okay, so you're just kind of hearing about it and thinking about it. And it gets clearer and clearer, and then you meditate on it, which is not bringing new information to the cushion. It's reinforcing the information you've already learned. So you meditate and you meditate and you meditate again and again on the difference between love and attachment. Love and attachment are different. They get focused on the same person often, but they can't exist at the same time because they're contradictory. Love wants the other to have happiness. Attachment wants <laughs> happiness to come from the object, right? Very simple. And yet, if you look at your daily life, do you live in such a way that reflects your knowledge of the difference between those two? <laughs> or do you still have many conflicts related to your misunderstanding of the difference between love and attachment? Right? And then you beat yourself up because you think, well, I know better. I've known the difference between love and attachment my whole adult life. And then I met Buddhism and it got even clearer. And yet I just had a fight with my mother or yet I just had a fight with my boss. And the problem was thwarted attachment. And I thought I was being loving. Crap, <laughs> right? And what's happened is that your mental factor of discernment hadn't gotten reconditioned well enough. It hadn't been re-educated well enough, which is why meditation is something that has to happen again and again until discernment kind of automatically labels things more accurately. But for it to be automatic and spontaneous, it needs a lot of effort and repetition. And then just naturally, as if naturally, you see things more accurately but it's only natural through a repetition, yeah? When we say natural, we just mean habitual. It doesn't mean accurate or inaccurate per se. Do you know what I mean? So discrimination gets re-educated through hearing, contemplating, and meditating. And that's very important because how we describe our situation to ourselves 
is so powerful in whether or not we believe the feelings to be a true assessment of the experience. Yeah, it's, it's very much like athletes who are training for something. They train themselves to believe that the burn they feel while exercising is making them stronger. In the early part of their training, that same experience had a deeper effect, but then they got used to reframing it as this is making me stronger, this is making me stronger, until such a point that some athletes even like the feeling of the burn, even prior to the endorphin rush. Yeah, you've reconditioned yourself. It's why people that are very much into, um, you know, problematic behaviors related to SNM, you can start to understand how they've reframed things to be pleasant for them through a conditioning process. And, you know, it's one of these things that we want to look at in, with kind of objectivity, because it's so easy for us to say, I just don't understand people who dot, dot, dot. The people that behave differently to us have conditioned their mental factor of discernment differently. So life really appears differently to them. So of course they're gonna respond differently to life. It's just associations and repetitions. You with me? Yeah. Okay, so then we'll do another one. Okay. So then take intention. This is the classic conversation, which you've probably heard many times, which is basically intention is the main factor in planting karmic seeds. We monitor this drive and we purify swiftly when off track. So the mind wants to move towards something negative, which it's gonna hold its attention on, come into contact with, water old seeds of, have a feeling about, and re-describe in a problematic way, which then reinforces negative intentions. It becomes a whole trap, unless you decide to kind of take the reins of intention and say, let's monitor this. Let's monitor the movement. Let's monitor the engagement and notice when it's gone off track and swiftly purify, swiftly purify, okay? Or you can go to attention first, right? Which focuses the mind. And what we set our focus on engages contact. So we're attentive to both what we come into contact with and attentively engage with it. So whether you're looking at intention first or attention first or contact first, it doesn't really matter. Just pick one to retrain. And for yourself as an individual, really look at this list as what is the one I have either the most problematic relationship with or what is the one that I already have positive momentum and positive change with? So you can either start to address the most problematic one, or you can try and reinforce the one that already has positive momentum. But this is kind of the way of reorganizing the mind so that every moment is conditioned in a much more positive way. Okay, so just to look at them all as a group, they're always there all the time with every single primary consciousness and which primary consciousness is the dominant one is gonna change, but all the time you have these five. Okay, so yeah, question, go ahead. Thank you for that, that over sur survey. And um, I'm kind of stuck on intention right now. And, and I think it's, because um, my discernment was trained as a lawyer. And I've always been very careful in Buddhism um, to distinguish between intention and motivations. Yeah. But now I'm thinking my idea of intention is not really consistent with what you're talking about and is actually more legalistic because of the, from a, from a legal standpoint, intention is defined in terms of volition. Yeah. Like, there has to be this sort of like what we, what is called scienter and you know is the main thing in criminal laws like that you intended to do something that it wasn't just like I was driving and then all of a sudden there was a deer and I hit it you know what I mean there's no intention there 
But the way you describe it, it doesn't sound volitional. It sounds more like I was driving, there's a deer there, I hit it. And somehow that's the way my karma is ripening and, and there's some intention behind that. Why well, am I, it, how do you reconcile those? Well, it's, it's that you're only talking about one thing as if there aren't other things happening simultaneously. Yeah, so intention is a tricky word and it is actually even translated as volition sometimes or will sometimes. And all of them are not quite perfect for the Tibetan or the Sanskrit, but it's close. And what we're talking about is the movement of the mind, but sometimes the movement of the mind is very clear to us. And sometimes the movement of the mind, we have a much more passive experience of. Like there's intention created when you're dreaming, but it could be a lucid dream or a non-lucid dream. If we put it into like psychological terms, is it conscious or unconscious? And that framework in Buddhism, we kind of put it to, to one side because intention itself is just the movement, but what is it carrying? Yeah, so if the movement of the mind is carrying anger, it's carrying the intention to harm. So it's moving in a harmful direction. If intention is carrying love with it, it has the intention for the other to have happiness. So intention is always together with other things. And some of those things are clear to us. We have self-awareness about. And some of those things are so habitual and so kind of background, for lack of a better word, we don't even notice. And that's what, you know, in the West we would call, oh, it's a bit self-conscious or sorry, it's a bit subconscious. Yeah, because it feels less um, clear to our mind why we do what we do. Yeah, if that helps. So intention always has somebody else driving or somebody else together with it, whether it's a positive state of mind, a negative state of mind, or a neutral state of mind. And, um, you know, that's what colors, what kind of karma it's going to be. The discernment colors, what kind of karma it's going to be. All sorts of things color it, but, you know, kind of take the teaching on karma and what creates the strongest karma is very much like the law. For example, the act of killing. If you see the object, <laughs> you want to kill the object, you do kill the object and you're happy about it, that is a very heavy karma. If you see it, want to kill it, but decide not to, it's lighter. If you don't even notice it, but you kill it accidentally, even lighter. You know, it's very much like the law in that way. But many things are coming together to dictate the weight and the impact and the result. <clears throat> so if I could ask, one follow up. Um, sure. You, from a psychology standpoint, um, we, there's this phenomenon of projecting our shadow, which is an unconscious process, right? We project some part of ourselves that we've repressed, but it comes with an ang often with anger and sort of this anger that we react to that projection. So, from a psychological standpoint, because it's coming from an unconscious area, we would say that's not an intentional thing. But from what you're describing from a Buddhist standpoint, because that's carrying the intention, the sort of anger with it, of, of projecting as something that we're not happy with in ourselves or something, then it actually is a form of intention. Well, it's, it's several things at once. That's where it gets tricky. So if you take the concept of projection or transference, what you've got going on is the way you've conditioned discernment. The way you've conditioned discernment is to say, these set of behaviors and this kind of person is either beneficial to me or harmful to me. And if they're beneficial to me, I must have more of them more often in the ways that I like. And if I don't, I am angry and they will be punished. Even if they're just punished by kind of a passive aggressive grumpy face, they will be punished, <laughs> right? So it's like you've got um, a miss diagnosis of what's happening because the way your discernment has developed over time is colored by your karma, colored by your habits, colored by what you come into contact with, colored by a million things. And then you have intention. So it's like your intention was preloaded by so much habit, which is why you just kind of pick one of those mental factors to start working on your relationship with. Because together with projection, for example, might also be 
a feeling that's unpleasant. And you think, right, that what you're projecting is true and the person there is giving you that feeling. So you could either decide to work on how you're describing that person and that kind of person, or you could decide to work on your relationship to your feelings of aversion and discomfort. You could pick one, right? And just kind of pick which one feels like it has the most potential for workability for you as an individual in that moment. Sometimes our, our, our feeling experience is too powerful to work with. So we need to just kind of let it settle because it will settle and then come back to what was I labeling it as? What was I coming into contact with? What conditioned this response? And is there a way I can recondition my response so that I'm watering different seeds, different types of seeds the next time I see them? It's a little bit like when you are really wanting to like someone who annoys you. <laughs> yeah. And you know they annoy you. They're a condition for discomfort to arise. And so when you're away from them, you try and recondition your mind by thinking of their positive qualities, the way they help you, the way they help other people, the suffering that influenced their bad behavior, many, many things until your discernment sees their behavior differently. And you see their same old rude behavior, but now what it means is they're suffering. And what that does is conjure up compassion. Whereas before that same rude behavior made you think, bad person, disagreeable, I'm uncomfortable, I am angry. Their behavior didn't have to change. They could remain kind of, you know, objectively rude by worldly convention, but your response to that changes based on how you've reconditioned your mind. And the good thing about the mind is that negative states of mind are temporary, they're inaccurate, they're removable. Positive states of mind can actually be reinforced to such a degree that they're stably present. And that's how we get people like His Holiness the Dalai Lama or people like Lama Yeshi and Lama Zopa Rinpoche who have so developed their mind, reconditioned discernment that a, that a mental factor like love has actually become one with a main mind, which means everything is colored by love. All of their mental factors are colored by love all the time. And it's only through habituation that you know, you're know you practicing with these mental factors, with conception, with analysis, but eventually it becomes perceptual. You can't make negative states of mind perceptual. Yeah. You can certainly make them habitual and default, and that's what we've done. You know, It's very easy to get angry. It's hard to be automatically loving at all times, but you can always remove that anger. So that's good news. <laughs> other, other thoughts and questions before we have a stretch and a meditation? I have a question uh, um, about wh when we say everything is happening at this moment are tainted by old karma. How, how old is this karma? It can be very old karma, like it's coming now or or just a karma from yesterday like well um it turns out that john lennon was not completely correct instant karma is not going to get you okay. <laughs> instant, instant karma is very rare <laughs> <laughs> um, if you read the Lamrim, um, the karma section of the Lamrim, it helps you understand the timing of karmic results, what happens first, what happens second, what's strong, what's light. Um, most of what you're experiencing in this moment is probably from quite far in the past, but you're meeting with present day conditions. You know, so the conditions of this moment, the present moment is important, but you're not giving too much credit to the present moment as a causation. You're just looking at it as conditions. Yeah. And you're looking at patterns, right? So if you're constantly getting criticized and yet you're a very nice person who's not doing anything wrong, you know, you've got an old criticism karma that's playing out. It's finishing, it's exhausting itself, and you can help your own mind by not creating more of the same. You can help your own mind by not reacting poorly, but it might keep playing out once that particular seed got watered. 
Yeah, which is why we do so much work with purification as kind of a preemptive strike to prevent those old seeds from ripening as present day karma. So which karma is happening when and how and why? Again, it's an extremely hidden phenomena, more hard to understand than emptiness. But you can make an educated guess because causes and conditions are of a similar type. So you can make an educated guess. Yeah, um, sometimes it's helpful if you're experiencing things that you don't have a lot of, I don't know, participation in these days. Like, I don't know if people keep stealing from you, but you don't steal anything and you haven't stolen your whole life. It can be interesting because you think, wow, I really don't deserve it in this life, but I created the cause for it in the past. I was dodgy. Wow, okay. Note to self, don't be dodgy. Yeah, <laughs> right, simple as that. Yeah, and you know, and it, it's, it can be hard because it doesn't feel fair, but it's not about an external godlike figure punishing or rewarding. It's just natural cause and effect. If you put a little apple seed in the ground and you ignored it for years, and then you came and watered it, it could still sprout even though you ignored it for years. Or you could water it that day and it starts to sprout, but it's hanging out as a potentiality. Yes. And even the the feelings that because um, I I since I do meditation my feelings I'm sensitive to my feelings that my emotions that is arising and sometimes they are for no reason they are I just feeling good after a, a meditation and sometimes it I feel like sad after a meditation so uh, I was asking myself is it a karma related related or it's because I did a good job for meditating or or not really present for my meditation that's because it's changing all the time and you don't know really why yeah and and sometimes we're meditating with a good motivation and we're watering positive seeds and we only experience the ripening of that seed some hours later Sometimes we're meditating because we feel like we should to be a good girl and do the right thing. And that is all full of all sorts of problematic things. And you're actually watering old negative seeds, even though it's kind of a positive thing that you're trying to do. Your motivation's all mixed up. And so you're watering old negative seeds. Th these things can happen a lot. And, and I think that you know, things like therapy and psychology and going counseling can be really useful in understanding your habits and your expectations. But the problem is, is that you could start to think you could get to the bottom of it. Right? There's no bottom. Yeah, there's no bottom. It's beginning with time. So at a certain point, you go, okay, I understand how this mind is trending. And I understand what is problematic about it. And sure, something about my childhood, something about this trauma has an influence, certainly. But if it was the exact reason, everyone who experienced that, ex that type of childhood or that type of trauma would react exactly the same way. And you know, that's not true. Mm -hmm. It's too many conditions. You'll never mm -hmm. get to the bottom of it. So kind of in a way, relax and let go with knowing enough to work with your mind. Yeah, um, Sne, yeah. you had one thing. Yeah, thanks, Lada. Yes, Van Vogt, it's a, it's a related question to this thing about um, feeling and karma. And in my case, I really feel like it's a dissonance because I really think it's the object that creates a good feeling. And then, like, if I'm trying to prove it to myself, then I think, but it is the object because, you know, the coffee tastes so good. And if you gave me tea, I'd be like, no it creates an unpleasant feeling. It's the object, you know, where it doesn't feel like it's a past car karma ripening. And so I'm just trying to think like, how do I get over, over attributing feelings to the object and really recognizing that it's, um, because, you know, I, 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 I understand, I hear it, but I just don't believe it. I think at some level. Well, you're not pretending that conditions don't have an effect. You have an association with that condition. You have an habituation with that condition, but it, you know that it, it, it's not the substantial cause because if you drank only coffee the whole day through and never any water and nothing, anything else, you know that you would feel ill. You know, you, you know that you probably tried that. I've tried that drinking coffee all day. It doesn't end well, right? The digestion rebels. 
Um, but, <laughs> you know, there, there's part of us that knows that every time I do this, it kind of works for what I want. But if I did only this, it would stop working eventually. Mm. You know, you do know that. So you're not pretending that conditions don't have an effect. They have an effect because of the conditioning you've brought to them. You know, we assume everyone likes chocolate. People who grew up in Tibet don't necessarily like chocolate, but they do like rancid butter. We find rancid butter problematic, right? It's associations that we've brought to the object. Yeah. And then that, you know, then we're used to it and then we reinforce it. So, you know, you're part of working with the mental factor of contact is asking yourself, is repeated contact with certain conditions a useful thing or a not useful thing in terms of my path and my development? Are there things I need to avoid contact with because they're reinforcing something negative? Someone has put Vegemite in the chat and obviously Vegemite is always okay. But, <laughs> right? Especially paired with butter on toast just a light layer. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like we, we really have to look at we're not pretending that our daily life and our habits haven't sort of been working for us because we're not stupid. We wouldn't keep doing it if it didn't sort of work. It's just that we've given it too much power. Yeah, it's, it, we've given it too much credit. And we can reassociate and change our associations. It's just a matter of habit. And you know, neuroscientists would say the same thing. So when we say, you know, past karma ripening in the feeling aggregate, does it represent both the idea that it's my prior disposition to already like something, it's my habit to like coffee, um, but it's also that if I have done something in the past that deserves or that would be experienced in a pleasurable way, it happens to be that coffee? I think you're making it too simple. There, there's so okay. much going on in every moment. There's so many seeds being watered in every moment. And, and keep remembering that the five omnipresent mental factors are all five present and all five, you know, moving and ticking along and have their own habituation. And so, you know, to just kind of pick one to take the reins of is a very okay. productive thing. And you can start going down the rabbit hole of just one of them. And it's very fascinating. But again, you're not going to get to the bottom of it because it's an extremely hidden phenomena. Start to identify the trends. Start to identify the trends and kind of there's a few obvious reasons why psychologically and logically. There's a few reasons why from a Buddhist perspective, from a science perspective, that's enough information for now because I already knew it wasn't helping. <laughs> You know, I already knew it was leading me to waste money or waste time or have problematic relationships or cost to my health. I already knew that much. Now let's just kind of start working on it. And part of it is not identifying too much with it. There was a coming together of things which led us to a set of behaviors. It's not like, I don't know, the inheritance of the person we were when we created that karma. We might be a very different person now but we've inherited a whole set of seeds. So then it becomes about what is the legacy I want to leave for my future self? You know, and that, that kind of um, estate planning is useful, <laughs> inner estate planning. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we'll have like a two minute stretch and then a meditation.
Okay, come on back. And get yourself into meditation posture. Nice straight back. And uh, just shift a second in your seat and see if you can get yourself into a balanced way of being so that your spine feels like it's up and down, nice and straight, but isn't tense. And a few intentional deep breaths, just letting yourself settle. And lightly rest your focus on the breath or on the soles of your feet. But just one gentle physical focus to allow the surface distractions to settle. and revive your mental intention, conditioning it with a positive motivation. May I understand the mechanisms of my mind in order to move them in a more beneficial direction, all the way to my fullest potential so that I can be of greatest benefit to all sentient beings. Stable happiness for myself and others. And now you know that you have five omnipresent mental factors in every moment. See if you can experientially start to identify them. So first check in with the mental factor of feeling, the experience of positive, negative or neutral, happening in your body and happening in your mind. See if you can describe your own feelings to yourself without getting lost in a story. Just settle your attention on feeling. Find it. Is your body uncomfortable, neutral, or comfortable? Is your mind trending in a pleasant way, unpleasant or neutral? Just notice and watch, feeling changing moment to moment.
and then shift to the part of the mind that is able to discern that feeling, discernment itself, a bit like the watcher or the labeler. See if you can identify and become specific about that part of your mind that is able to recognize and discern. So right now it's recognizing and discerning different mental experiences like feeling. And let it keep doing that, it will anyway. But see if you can really zero in on that part specifically and watch it do what it does. This is this, that is that. And then there is the part of the mind that is attentive to this whole process of identifying and watching and checking. There is a part of the mind that is focusing, holding, noticing that, that mental factor of attention or mental engagement. Notice it doing what it does not judging it, just seeing it. Who attends? What focuses? Notice it. And notice the way what you're attending to leads you to what the mind moves towards or away from. The mind moving towards and being curious about certain things. The mind bored with and moving away from other things. Just let your attention watch your intention. Let your discernment Notice what is intention. So here you're just looking for movement. Watch the part of the mind that goes towards, away, settles, drifts.
And does that intention want to come into contact with certain sensory experiences or inner thoughts? Where is that feeling of meeting, connecting one thing to another, inside to outside, or different inner things to each other? Just look for the connector, the mental factor of contact. And then let go of any kind of identifying of the specifics of these mental factors and just observe mental factors in general, like the weather of your mind, all interacting with each other, changing moment to moment, some verbals, some more visceral, just watch the weather without engagement. See how these mental factors change constantly. Like clouds drifting. and pull back even further to the sky-like nature of the mind. It reflects that weather, all of that movement, all of that conversation, all of that experience. What is behind or above it? The spacious clarity that is also present. that aspect that reflects more than judges. That knows without engagement. Looks in general, not so specific. and gradually shift your focus back to your body and the weight of yourself in your chair or on the cushion.
present and solid and grounded. And think through the positive energy of these observations and this study. May we make the mind a Buddha's mind by developing those positive states, decreasing the negative states, all the way to enlightenment. Jancha semchorim poche, ma ke panam ke yuchi. Ke pan yam pa me pai, done gondu kawasho. Okay. Thanks, everyone.